This video was produced by My name is Dave Pruitt. I'm an emeritus, emeritus a faculty member in mathematics, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alexander Wills. There he is. <laughs> Hello. He was over there a moment ago. Um, Alex, Alex is currently at Susquehanna University, Pennsylvania, in the Department of Mathematical Sciences. He grew up in western Massachusetts, went from there to Oberlin College, where he got a bachelor's degree in mathematics in 1983. And then from there to the University of Massachusetts, where he got a PhD in mathematics in 1989. Even though he's in the Department of Mathematical Sciences, uh, he's at least half physicist, because um, many of his <laughs> mathematical interests have to do with quantum mechanics. And they are far ranging. The foundations of quantum mechanics, functional analysis, ordered sets and lattices, quantum information theory and probability theory, and topology. He has at least 40 publications, but who's counting? Um, and he's got all kinds of teaching experience. He's been at the University of New Hampshire, uh, University of Pittsburgh and Johnstown, and uh, Juniata College. Uh, he's also married to an academic who is a professor of government and environmental studies, and they have a son named Griffin. I think he, being a logician, he also likes logical puzzles, and on his website is uh, this strange uh, sequence of words with um, <coughs> pose as a problem to punctuate this sequence of words in such a way that it makes both logical and grammatical sense. And here's the state. Or means either, either, or, or, and. I haven't been able to do that yet. <laughs> but anyway, welcome Alex, and the topic for today is a gentle introduction to quantum logic. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to thank um, the organizers, Tracy and Tom, for putting together this, this, um, this wonderful um, meeting, and uh, I think probably Tracy in particular for thinking of me and uh, uh, arranging the invitation, which I was very delighted to accept. Um, I, I have a number of, um, what should we call them? Um, admissions, uh, confessions, disclaimers, uh, to make, um, I'll, I'll uh, maybe apologies also. Uh, I'll start with an apology. Um, you'll, you'll notice the discrepancy between the advertised title and the title on the slide. Um, Tracy asked me uh, long ago and then proceeded to continue to ask me repeatedly um, for a title uh, for my talk. And at some point, he wrote me gently urging haste in, in, in this matter and suggesting the title, A Gentle Introduction to Quantum Logic. Um, and I, I, I thought about that, and I, uh, I took my time thinking about that, and I eventually thought, no, perhaps I like this title better, and I sent it, uh, sent it to Terry, but by then, alas, the programs had already been printed. Um, uh, that, that brings me to the next of my um, ap apologies or, or confessions or whatever we want to call them. Um, when Terry... Um, Not Terry, sorry, Tracy asked me um, for that title and suggested a gentle introduction to quantum logic. Uh, I think his emails also had included some suggestion that it would be a fairly general audience and there'd be many undergraduates and some from philosophy, maybe many from philosophy. Not, not everyone um, necessarily um, at a place from, from which they, they would um, welcome an ungentle introduction to quantum logic. Um, and that made me very nervous. I thought, well, gee, the, the kind of introduction I'd be inclined to give 
I don't, I'm not sure that it would be all that gentle. Um, so, so maybe I should tone it down. And I thought uh, hard about, about that. And um, at some point, I just decided that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I was very successful. And so perhaps the title wouldn't be exactly appropriate. I thought two stories would, would cover what I want to do. Um, so yeah, another, another mistake I made was, um, was this, Terry, uh, I keep calling you Terry because I had, I had a dean that I liked very much called Terry, so it's actually a compliment. I, I, I haven't gotten along with deans very well, but this one dean was remarkable. Um, Tracy, Tracy um, said, you know, uh, the physics department um, would perhaps pay for your hotel room if you'd give them a talk. And I said, well, that sounds good, okay. Um, and I didn't think to ask anything about that audience. I just said, physics department, okay, I'll give my usual sort of, sort of, you know, right at them talk. And, and I, I, I arrived uh, only to find that the room uh, was full of undergraduates. And I had certainly not prepared an undergraduate talk. Um, so that was very embarrassing. Um, I'm not sure that this is quite as undergraduate an audience as I had intended. So maybe this talk, I don't know, maybe it's not too ungentle, we'll see. All right, let me, let me stop apologizing um, and, and start uh, talking. So I'm going to tell you two stories about quantum logic. And in the course of telling you those stories, I hope at least to convey something of the flavor of what, what is meant by quantum logic and what it's about. Um, I'm going to start by telling you about some rather astounding claims, or maybe an astounding claim repeated by various people. Um, from the, well, arguably from the late 1920s all the way through the late 60s and beyond. Um, in order to make sense of this claim, I'm going to need to put in place some technical background concerning quantum mechanics, concerning classical logic, concerning ordered sets and lattices, which is a lot. Um, but I think to make sense of what people were saying and why they were saying it, one needs at least to touch on all of these things, and that I will try to do reasonably gently. Um, then I'm going to want to talk more specifically about these astounding claims in the context of the idea of a state space and what one might call a physical logic. Um, and then finally, well, I should say parts one through three constitute the first story that I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell a different story about quantum logic very quickly at the end, just, just by way of a sketch, and then maybe suggest that we have two ways to look at this and they, they well, may, may, maybe that there's something that um, hangs on which choice we make. Okay, so here's the astounding claim in a nutshell. The claim is, um, well, it's, it's one we've sort of heard before this morning in, in Koji's talk, um, that logic is empirical. Um, but more than that, the claim is that not only is logical, logic empirical, but that in fact empirical considerations show that certain principles of classical logic, certain tautologies in fact, mm -hmm. rightly looked at are simply wrong. They're simply false, at least as general rules. This is a claim that was not exactly advanced, but perhaps hinted at by uh, John von Neumann, one of the first people, arguably the first person, to put mathematics on a, a mathematically rigorous basis um, in work going back as far as 1927, right to the dawn of quantum mechanics as a, as a finished subject. Um, the claim was put more starkly um, in a, a very influential paper called The Logic of Quantum Mechanics uh, by von Neumann and a then young American mathematician by the name of Garrett Birkhoff, and that's from 1936. Um, and then the claim was, was repeated by a, a, a number of people um, with, with even more emphasis and force, maybe stridency. The most famous of these is Hilary Putnam uh, in 1968, but there were others at the same time and have been others since advancing the same claim. Let me give you some examples. Um, do it this way? Yes. So here is a picture of von Neumann. He's that little boy there. I, I chose that picture um, actually first because I think it's sort of a sweet picture. Um, that's von Neumann in 1915. Um, he's probably solving a partial differential equation. Von Neumann was uh, a, a monster 
prodigy and at, at a, a ridiculously young age ended up getting two simultaneous doctorates, one in mathematics uh, at the University of Göttingen working under David Hilbert, the, the great mathematician of the day, um, and simultaneously because his father was not sure he would be able to make a good living as a mathematician, and so to, to, to please his father, simultaneously he was getting a PhD in chemical engineering at the ETH in Zurich, and he would take the train back and forth. Um, I found it hard enough to get one PhD, and not even under Hilbert. So, you know, this is quite a feat. At any rate, um, just, just having finished his doctoral studies, he wrote three very influential papers and then assembled them into a, an even more influential book. Um, and one of the things that he noticed in one of these papers is that the formal structure of quantum mechanics has embedded in it something that looks a great deal like propositional logic, something that functions very much like propositional logic, something that supports a kind of probability calculus in just the way that classical logic supports a, prob a probability calculus. Um, the quote here is just a little snip from a larger discussion. He says of this calculus, that, of this logical calculus he's found inside quantum mechanics, that in contrast to the concept of ordinary logic, quantum mechanics, or the logic he's finding in quantum uh, mechanics, is extended by a concept of, so to call it, simultaneous decidability, which is characteristic for quantum mechanics. So it's classical logic plus a new idea. Maybe something richer than classical logic. All right, so the, a little later, about 10 years later, um, a somewhat older von Neumann and uh, the, the then young Garrett Burkhoff um, wrote this, uh, this paper I've mentioned, The Logic of Quantum Mechanics, in which they're much more explicit about what is being claimed. Um, just to read the, the, the quote, the, the considerations of the paper suggest that the physically significant statements in quantum mechanics actually constitute not a Boolean algebra, which is the standard model of classical propositional logic, but a kind of projective geometry. And hence, that the study of mechanics taken to understand, uh, to, to, to comprehend quantum mechanics, points to the distributive identities as the weakest link in the algebra of logic. Um, one of the things that they, they mention in, in this context um, might be worth adding. At the time that this paper was written, there had already been um, a fair amount of discussion um, amongst mathematicians, or at least some mathematicians and logicians, of the idea that um, there's something fishy about negation in classical logic. Um, intuitionist mathematicians don't like classical negation. They don't like um, the law of the excluded middle. Um, what Burkhoff and von Neumann were suggesting was that actually negation is fine, at least as far as quantum mechanics is concerned. It works as you would expect it to, but there's something wrong with the distributive law. All right, so von Neumann is a very, very influential figure. People listened when he talked. Um, the idea certainly percolated through the consciousness of, of many people. And it emerged um, <laughs> in, in armor with banners flying and, and trumpets in uh, a famous paper of uh, Hilary Putnam from 1968. Um, Putnam asserts in the paper um, that it's indeed possible for the supposedly necessary truths of classical logic to turn out to be wrong for empirical reasons um, and cites quantum mechanics as, as an instance of this and goes on to say that logic is, should be regarded as an empirical science or a natural science, just as much so as geometry. He's thinking of the strange logic of quantum mechanics as being in some way akin to the non-Euclidean geometry that one finds in relativistic physics. Uh, and in fact, makes a, um, an effort to develop that analogy in some detail. Um, I won't go into it here. The, the paper makes Actually, wonderful reading, just if, if nothing else, just as a, an example of really interesting rhetoric. Um, all right, well, more in the same vein. As I said, lots of people 
proposed similar things. Um, the most recent statement of this sort that I've been able to find is from about 1990. Uh, it's in a textbook published by two well-known mathematical physicists at Harvard, uh, Bam uh, 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 Bamberg and Sternberg. Um, I have a two-volume textbook called A Course in Mathematics for Students of Physics. Um, and in the very last chapter of the last volume, they talk a little bit about quantum logic and say, in fact, quantum mechanics represents the most profound revolution in the history of science because it modifies the elementary rules of logic. All right, so what does this mean? What could this mean? How could people say such things? Um, this seems, can we say crazy a little bit? Um, well, in order to understand why some fairly smart people might have said such things and to understand what they might have meant, we're going to need a little bit of background. We're going to need to talk just a little bit about quantum mechanics and its structure. Um, something actually I'll come back to at a couple of points in the talk, looking at it from different angles. And we should review classical propositional logic. And we should also talk just a little bit about the mathematics of ordered sets. And let me say um, a little bit about why. Burkhoff, as, as some of you probably know, um, was influential as one of the first developers and, and as a great um, sort of apostle of the study of ordered sets and lattices as a sort of um, respectable mathematical enterprise. Um, and he wrote a very famous monograph on lattice theory right around the time he was working with um, von Neumann, actually a little bit later, early 40s. Um, but a lot of the the way in which the Burkhoff and von Neumann paper looks at logic is influenced by, conditioned by, um, a view of logic as somehow tied up with the study of ordered sets and lattices. And I'll come back to that as well. OK. Here's quantum mechanics in a nutshell, which is, of course, a, a, just an absurd thing to try to, to present, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, in quantum mechanics, observables, by which we mean roughly the kinds of quantities that we could, in principle, measure experimentally, are represented by linear operators, linear transformations, if you will, acting on a Hilbert space, generically script H. Incidentally, you, you remember von Neumann was a student of Hilbert. It is von Neumann who named Hilbert spaces after his doctoral advisor. And there's a famous anecdote, possibly apocryphal, that in some seminar, Hilbert uh, raised his hand afterwards and said, it's all very fascinating, but will someone please tell me, what is a Hilbert space? <laughs> OK, well, you perhaps are also asking this question. Um, so what is a Hilbert space? Well, um, I'm not going to tell you. Um, but, but we'll adopt a polite fiction which will be sufficient to, to get us through the talk and is, I think, not too misleading at least as far as the points I want to make are concerned. The polite <laughs> fiction is that this Hilbert space H is just Rn, R is the, the familiar n-dimensional Euclidean space consisting of n-tuples of real numbers. Now, this is wrong, first of all, um, because the kind of Hilbert space you encounter in most formulations of quantum mechanics actually consists of n-tuples of um, complex numbers, and secondly, because n is infinite. But let's pass over these things, OK? We, we don't need to worry about that here, right? So for most of what I'm going to do, it will actually be sufficient if you think of n as 3, in which case our Hilbert space is just the familiar three-dimensional Euclidean space of solid geometry. OK, so linear operators then are operators that act on this space, move vectors around in a linear way. They preserve the origin. They map vector sums to vector sums. They play nicely with scalar multiplication. Two such operators represent a, uh, representing observables are simultaneously measurable, or the observables that they represent are simultaneously measurable or compatible, if and only if the operators commute. It doesn't matter in which order you apply them. Where did von Neumann find anything like propositional logic in here? Well, it turns out that if you know the lingo, the set of values that an, an observable can take are precisely the points in the spectrum, the set of eigenvalues of the operator. It turns out that observables that only take the two values 1 and 0, 
which you can regard as yes and no, if you like, are represented precisely by projection operators. These are easy to see in your mind's eye, at least in three dimensions. If I have a plane and I have a vector, plane, vector, I can drop a perpendicular from the tip of the vector to the plane, and I have projected the vector into the plane. That's a linear operator. Uh, similarly, I can project an, a line onto a line, or indeed a plane onto a, onto a line. This set of projections acts like a propositional calculus. More on that as we go. Um, but one point to make for later reference, um, the correspondence between the projection operators and the lines or planes, more generally the subspaces that they project onto, is one to one. All of the relevant logical structure is carried over. So in effect, we can say that the yes, no observables simply are the subspaces of H. OK, so that's quantum mechanics in a, a ridiculously small nutshell, which I get it into by means of lies. OK. Um, but, but, they're, but they're benign lies. Um, let's take a quick look at propositional logic. Now, this I, I, I was thinking would be essential for maybe a somewhat different audience, so I'll go quickly. Propositions can be true or false. Uh, we can think of a proposition, perhaps mathematically, as a variable taking those values, true and false. Um, propositions are related by, uh, by implication. P implies Q. If Q is true whenever P is, and we will write implication that way with that double arrow. Um, a tiny note, I don't mean here the connective, I mean the relation between propositions. Yes, so that's not a connective, that's a relation between two propositions. We know how to combine propositions, the, the familiar logical connectives. Uh, are defined by their truth tables. There's the truth table for and, which I'm writing with an ampersand for, for a reason. Um, here is the truth table for or, which I am writing as or for a reason. Um, it's worth noticing that simply because of the truth tables, um, whenever P and Q is true, both P and Q are true. And whenever both P and Q are true, then P or true, Q is true, but more, more generally, whenever P or Q is true, P or Q is true. So the proposition P and Q implies both of the propositions, P and Q, and the propositions P and Q themselves each imply the proposition P or Q. Uh, finally, I'm going to write uh, a prime for negation. So P prime is the negation of P. It's true when P is false, and vice versa. All right, so on the basis of these constructions, we can already define a, uh, a kind of algebra of propositional logic with its own characteristic rules. Uh, an example is de Morgan's law. Uh, the negation of P or Q is not P and not Q. P and Q not, not P and Q is not P or not Q, and so on. And another of these characteristic identities is the distributive law that Burkhoff and von Neumann were talking about. The law that says that and distributes over or. Of course, there's actually a dual form in which or distributes over and, but just to, to cite the one instance in red there. Right? Everybody happy so far? And distributes over or. And if we check the truth tables, it's simply true. It's more or less obviously true. We don't need a truth table to tell us it's true. Clearly, if P is true and one or the other or both of Q and R are true, then either P and Q are both true or P and R are both true. This is just evident. How could it possibly fail? How could anyone not insane suggest that it could fail, that any empirical consideration could, could um, militate against it? Um, this slide I'm going to pass over very quickly. I might even come back to it. Of course, we can also encode propositions as sets if we want to think of maybe a big set S, which is the state of set of possible states of the world, then we can identify a proposition with the set of all states in which P is true. Um, and conversely, we can think that any subset of, of this set of possible ways the world could be defines a proposition, I guess simply the proposition that the world is in one of those states. Um, and then, yeah, oh, I've slipped up here. <laughs> I was trying very systematically to, um, you see the, the pointer here? I was trying not to use that symbol for the logical and, but I slipped up. And I was trying not to use that symbol for the logical or, but I slipped up. Um, I do that in class all the time. Uh, it's, it's a bad habit. I, I need to 
work harder. At any rate, as we all know, the logical conjunction translates into the intersection of, of sets. This also should be P and Q, and the logical disjunction into the union of sets as illustrated below. OK. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Propositions are ordered by implication. Order is kind of a basic thing. Let's talk about order. A partial ordering on a set L is a relation, two-place relation, just conventionally written as less than or equal to, but that's just a convenient symbol, uh, a suggestive one, that um, satisfies three conditions. The order has to be transitive. If A precedes B and B precedes C, A precedes C. It has to be anti-symmetric. If A precedes B and B also precedes A, it's only because A equals B. And it has to be reflexive. Everything precedes itself. Orders, orders in this sense, or partial orders, are ubiquitous in mathematics. Um, certainly any collection of numbers, ordinary, say, whole numbers or real numbers, is ordered by size. Two is less than or equal to five. It's the usual sense of the, of the symbol, less than or equal to. Um, equally, if you take any collection of sets, they can be ordered by inclusion. Um, we say that A is a subset of B, or is contained in B, if and only if every member of A is also a member of B. And the, the, the little um, hook with a line under it, the little in, uh, inclusion relation, that's a partial order. Any collection of propositions is ordered by implication. If we take P less than or equal to Q to mean P implies Q, then that's a partial order. And many other things are partially ordered as well. Um, there's a, a lovely convention, a kind of graphical convention, a pictorial convention for seeing small, finite ordered sets um, in your mind's eye for drawing them. Uh, these are usually called Hasse diagrams um, after a very nasty German mathematician by the name of Hasse. Um, the convention is this. If you have only a finite number, of, indeed a small finite number of points in your ordered set, um, draw sets that pre draw elements that precede other elements below them and draw a line sloping upward from the, the so to say, lesser element to the greater element um, in such a way that you actually only draw the lines where there is no intervening element. So for example, 0 is less than 1. There's nothing between 0 and 1 if I'm talking about whole numbers. So I draw a link from 0 to 1. Then 1 is less than 2 and so on. The, the uh, non-negative integers we could picture in this way as a sort of a chain of dots with links going up. I know that 2 is greater than 0 from the picture because there is a path going upward from 0 to 2. The convention is you only draw the link when the lesser element precedes the, 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 the greater element and nothing intervenes. But then if there are intervening points, you just trace uh, a longer path always going uphill. Um, at left, you see the Hasse diagram that corresponds to the implications that we talked about earlier among P and Q, P or Q, and P and Q themselves. P and Q implies, and therefore is below both P and Q. P and Q are below P or Q. Um, okay, those are Hasse diagrams. All right, let's talk about um, the idea of a join and the idea of a meet. If L is an ordered set and P and Q are elements of that ordered set, we write P, that should be read P join Q, to mean the smallest, the more than that, the unique smallest, I should stress. The unique smallest element, R in L, such that P and Q are both below R, or both precede R. And dually, the meet of P and Q, which is denoted by that wedge-like symbol, red P meet Q, is the unique largest element below both P and Q. Now, joins and meets do not need to exist. Um, given the placement of this podium, how many of you cannot see what is down here? Many, OK. I, I don't know if there's an easy fix other than maybe asking you to stand up. Um, let me see what I can do. I'm not sure that I can. I can't really raise that. Um, you'll, you'll have to just crane. I'm sorry. Um, in the, in the lower corner, I have a, a, a Hasse diagram for an ordered set in which there are two elements at the bottom, two elements above both of them, but neither of those two elements is greater than the other. So while there are minimal elements above P and Q, there's no least element above P and Q, no unique least element. On the right, I've added a red dot that indicates 
where that least element, if it were to exist, should go in the Hasse diagram. Um, right? So joins need not exist, and similarly, meets need not exist. But in many, many examples that are of interest, they do. A lattice is, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself just a bit. So a another example, an example in which they do exist, is the set of all propositions about some object or some system, where um, uh, if we have P and Q both less than R, meaning they both imply R, that certainly means that P or Q also implies R. So P or Q is exactly the join of P and Q in the usual implicational ordering. And similarly, P and Q is P meet Q. Join and meet, in this particular example, turn out to be or and and, respectively. So that's an example in which joins and meets do exist for all pairs of, of elements. More generally, a lattice is an ordered set in which, given any pair of elements, they have a join and a meet. A bounded lattice has one other property. It's, um, it's a lattice in which there's a greatest element that everything is below, and there's a least element that is below everything. Those are conventionally called one at the top, zero at the bottom. When I say lattice from now on, I mean bounded lattice. That's the only kind I'll consider. One can try to interpret a, a lattice, I should say a bounded lattice, as a non-classical logic. This was an idea that was very much in the air at the time Birkhoff and von Neumann were writing. Um, people had noticed this formal similarity between meets and joins and in, in arbitrary lattices and 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 or. And there's a certain temptation to say, well, maybe I should take an arbitrary lattice and maybe it would be helpful to think of its elements as propositions and of its ordering as an implication ordering. And maybe I should then think of meets and joins where I find them as and and or. All right, if that's the case, I might like to look at some familiar identities from classical logic, one of which is the distributive law or the distributive laws more correctly. A lattice is distributive if joins distribute over meets and meets distribute over joins. Certainly that happens in classical logic. It's clearly true for therefore for, for, for and and or. It's true equally for sets, uh, at least if you look at the totality of all subsets of a set um, where uh, joins and meets turn out to be unions and intersections respectively. But it's certainly not always true. Here is an example of a non-distributive lattice. It's a very simple example. There are three nodes in the middle, not related to one another by the ordering at all. There's a one and there's a zero. Zero is below A, below B, below C. A, B, and C are all below one. If we compute the join of A and B, that's the least thing above both of them. Well, there's only one thing above both of them, that's one. So one is A join B, A join B is one. Similarly, B join C is one, and A join C is also one. In particular, if we look at A join B and A join C, those are both one, so the meet of A join B and A join C is one meet one. What's one meet one? Well, it's the greatest thing that's below one and also below one. Everything is below itself, so one is below one, and therefore it's also below one, if I can say it that way, and so it's its own meet. So the meet of the joins is one. On the other hand, if we try to, in, in, in effect, factor out the A, if the distributive law were true, we would expect A join B meet A join C to equal A join B meet C. But what's B meet C? B meet C is zero. So A join B meet C is A join zero. What's A join zero? It's the least thing that's above both A and zero. Well, A is above both A and zero. Zero is not even above A. The only thing that works uh, the only things that work, the only things that are above both A and 0 are A and 1, and the least one is A. So A join 0 is A. A is not 1, so this is not a distributive lattice. Distributive identity fails. All right, here's another example. Suppose H is our n-dimensional Euclidean space, as before, our Hilbert space. Uh, think of n is equal to uh, 3 if it's helpful. Um, I'm going to let L of H be the set of all subspaces of H, lines, planes, higher dimensional subspaces through the origin, um, together with the point at the origin itself. That's a trivial subspace of, of the, the entire thing. And the entire space itself regarded as a sort of, again, um, trivial or degenerate subspace of the, the whole thing. Um, 
if we order subspaces, lines, planes, etc., by set inclusion, we have a lattice. In particular, um, in this lattice, if you have two, say, distinct lines, just for example, A and B, their meet is zero, their join is the, the plane that contains those two lines. If you have two distinct planes in three dimensions, their, I guess that got lost here, but this is in three dimensions. If you have two distinct planes, their join is going to be one. In other words, the whole space and their meet will be the line where they, where they intersect. This is essentially the von Neumann, I should really say von neumann burkhoff quantum logic, since these are the, the zero, one valued observables or a way of representing them. Um, continuing with this example, I claim it's not distributive and in fact it's easy to see why not. Suppose we have a plane, there's the plane in yellow, and suppose we have two lines, two distinct lines, not lying in that plane, you know, piercing it at, at the origin. Call them, uh, let's say, um, let's say call the two lines A and C, call the plane B, well, the, in, in three-dimensional space, what's the join of A and B? It's the smallest subspace containing the line, say the, say the blue line is A, um, containing the line A and the yellow plane, that's all of three-dimensional space, which is one, the biggest thing in our, our lattice. Um, and similarly for, for B join the other line, also that's one. But A meet B and B meet C and A meet C. The meet of any two of these three objects is just the origin, which is the zero of our lattice. So in fact, what we've just found here is an example of this structure, which we've already seen not to be distributive. OK. So that's the sense in which Birkhoff and von Neumann meant quantum logic isn't distributive. Um, since I'm burning through my time quickly, let me be um, equally quick about this. Um, if meets and joins serve as ands and ors, we might wonder what serves as a negation in one of these, in a sort of arbitrary lattice thought of as some kind of abstract logic. Um, one way to proceed is to talk about a lattice complement, a complement for, for an element A of an, uh, a lattice L, is some other element B whose join with A is the top element of the lattice and whose meet with A is the smallest element, zero. Now, if L were the lattice of all subsets of a set, this would actually mean that A and B are complementary subsets, that they would divide the set between them. Uh, it's not indicated here, but just to say it, if we're talking about all propositions about some object or system, this would simply say that B is the negation of A. However, in the non-distributive examples we just saw, one element can have multiple complements. Just look here. Both the blue line and the red line are complements for the yellow plane. The plane does not have a unique complement. Up here, B is a complement for A. C is equally a complement for A. There's not a unique complement. Well, there's a wonderful little theorem. It's, it's, it's an exercise, really, but it's beautiful. You should try to prove it. It's just a lovely exercise in manipulating the definitions. Um, if L is a distributive lattice, if the distributive law holds, then every element, actually I'm saying something a little bit wrong here. I should say then every element has at most one complement. If it has a complement, it's unique. It's a delightful exercise. One way to define a Boolean algebra, the best way to define a Boolean algebra, because it's the most elegant and the most efficient, is as a complemented distributive lattice, a distributive lattice in which every element has at least one and by this little exercise, only one complement. Evidently, the subspace lattice uh, L of H, which, which is complemented, is not uniquely complemented, so that's another way to see it can't be distributed. Where complements are not unique, you can, however, sometimes still pick out a preferred complement. You can do this in uh, the subspace lattice by taking, um, for a given subspace, not just any arbitrary complementary subspace, but the one that's perpendicular to the subspace you started with, or to use slightly fancier language orthogonal to it. Um, with that as maybe the motivating idea, an orthocomplementation on a lattice is any function or rule that assigns to each element of the lattice a preferred complement, so that these conditions that you see here hold. It turns out 
that a lattice with such a complementation rule, ortho complementation rule, an ortho lattice, um, satisfies a lot of the rules of classical propositional logic. Not necessarily the distributive law, but lots of other things. De Morgan's laws, for example, follow automatically. All right, so that's it for the background. Now let's go back to what von Neumann and Birkhoff and Putnam et alia could possibly have meant. Earlier I talked about a way of thinking about propositions as sets of states of the world, way the world, ways the world could be. Let's be a little less ambitious and not talk about the world. Let's talk about the set of states of some particular physical object or system, maybe a particle, whatever you like, um, and think of its states as the ways that, that it could be. That's, that set is that object's state space. A property of that object or system, a sort of intrinsic property, not a relational property that relates it to other systems, but a property of that system in itself, would correspond then to the set of possible states. At least classically, that's how you would do it. These would be the states in which that object, if in that state, has that property. So here's a simple sort of stupid example, but stupid examples are often the best ones <laughs> for some purposes. Our, ob our object maybe is a deck of cards, and its states might be the possible ways to shuffle it. It could be shuffled in any of 52 factorial ways. Um, and what are some properties? Well, having more black cards than red cards in the top half of the deck, that's a property. Some shuffles will produce that property, some won't. Um, having an ace on the top, that's a useful property if you can guarantee that. Um, maybe having red and black cards perfectly alternating. Right? If you know how to shuffle very well, you can probably arrange that. Um, all right, classically again, any possible subset of the state space defines a property. And from that point of view, the logic of properties of a physical system is just the logic of it, the subsets of its state space. It's just classical propositional logic. But does it have to be that way? Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Let's consider the possibility that maybe not every subset of the state space really represents a genuine physical property. Maybe there's something about the way real properties really hang together in the nature of some object that the object can't be confined to just any region of the state space, perhaps. So as a sort of a fanciful illustration, which I'm going to call a grid world, suppose the state space is this rectangular region that you see here. And suppose that the only truly physical properties corresponding to rectangular uh, are, uh, properties of this uh, system are those subsets of the state space that correspond to rectangular subregions lined up parallel to the axes of the, the big rectangle. So for example, the, the, the little area that I've called P in red, that would be a property. R is a property. Q is a property. Notice that the union of P and R, that's not a property because it's not a rectangle. It's two rectangles. It's not one rectangle. The big rectangle that surrounds P, Q, and R, that's a perfectly good rectangle, perfectly good property. If you were to ask, what is the smallest bona fide physical property that contains both P and, let's say, Q down there in the corner, you'll see that it is, in fact, the big rectangular area outlined in red. That includes R. That means that R is contained in P join Q. And that's enough to foil distributivity. The details are below, but I won't go through it similar to what we did in the earlier example. That's this physical system, if you, if you buy it, has a non-distributive, maybe one should put logic in scare quotes, but a non-distributive logic of allowed properties. Quantum mechanics works in much the same way. The state space of a quantum mechanical system is perhaps best thought of as a sphere. Uh, think of that as the set of unit length vectors in your space H, your Hilbert space H. But not just any subset of the sphere, not just any set of quantum states, counts as a legitimate physical property, or at least not one that is discussed by quantum mechanics. Only those that you obtain by passing subspaces through the origin and seeing where they intersect the sphere are allowed. So in effect, the allowed properties, again, correspond to the subspaces. Lines, planes, etc. And as we saw above, that's also not distributive. And one little thing that I'll mention is if you imagine, just to make it clear how this connects with that grid world example, picture an ordinary three-dimensional sphere. Got it in your head? 
Now consider the equator. You have that in your head? You can make the equator red, okay, just to make it colorful. Now pick three distinct points on the equator. Call them P, Q, and R. All right? If I ask, what is the join of P and, and Q, that's the smallest subspace, the smallest subset of the sphere I can get by passing a subspace through the origin that contains P and Q. Well, that's what I get when I pass the plane P and Q sit in through the origin. That gives me the whole equator, and I pick up R as well. So in fact, it's just like the grid world example, non-distributed in the same way. All right, all of this begs an obvious question, which is what can we possibly mean by saying that a property of a system is physical? What does that adjective mean? None of this is in any way compelling unless we can give some account of that adjective. Well, all right. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I have a very good answer to this question. I'm, I'm sort of skeptical about the whole story myself. One thing that one might say is that a property is physical if it can in principle be observed, tested in some way. One of the things that was also in the air when von Neumann and Burkhoff were writing was positivism. A general sort of instrumentalist slant towards physics was in much better odor then than it is now. And so for them, that might have been a perfectly reasonable way to proceed to answer this question. Um, one thing that this idea does suggest is that we should be able to assign probabilities to physical properties, whatever they are. It turns out you can define the idea of a probability very nicely in the context of an ortholattice. A probability measure on an ortholattice is a function. Alas, I've decided to call it P, which earlier was a proposition, but never mind. Um, that assigns to every element of the ortholattice a number between 0 and 1, its probability, in such, uh, in such a fashion that P of 1 is 1. P of the biggest thing is 1. The biggest thing is certain. And if, uh, if A is less than or equal to the ortho complement of B, that's a way of saying A and B are sort of as, as disjoint as they can be, then you would like P of, I'm sorry, again, a, a typo, P of A join B should be P of A plus B. Specialized to a Boolean algebra, that's the usual definition. There's a very, very remarkable theorem. It's almost worth giving a talk like this just to advertise this theorem. So remarkable is it. Due to uh, Andrew Gleason, about 1957, um, showing that the only prop, uh, probability measures that there are on the lattice of subspaces of a Hilbert space H, small restriction, not in the slide. Um, the dimension of H has to be bigger than 2 for this to work. But that covers most of the cases. Um, the probability measures on that lattice correspond exactly to the usual description of states in quantum mechanics, allowing for what are called mixed states, which are just weighted averages of the states corresponding to the points on the sphere. In fact, if you know Gleason's theorem, you can actually go ahead and reconstruct all of the rest of the apparatus of quantum mechanics purely as a probability calculus based on this quantum logic. So this is all actually looking pretty good. One thing that you might ask, though, is what happened to the rest of the subsets of the state space? Why aren't they legitimate properties? Why can't I just embed the, the logic in this you know, obvious Boolean algebra that's just sitting there? Well, you can do that. But it turns out that when you do that, none of the probability measures associated with um, Gleason's theorem, none of the probability measures that correspond to actual quantum mechanical states in the physics, none of them lifts to a probability measure on this big Boolean algebra. So yes, you can, you can, you can say uh, my so-called logic is sitting inside a bigger classical logic, but in passing from one to the other, you lose all the, all the probability assignments, which is a pretty big thing to lose if you're actually trying to do anything with this theory. In fact, you can prove more generally that there is no way of embedding L of H in any Boolean algebra in such a way as to, to uh, allow prob uh, probability measures to survive. On the other hand, if you look inside L of H, you can find lots and lots of little Boolean algebras. I won't go into it, but there's a way of regarding L of H as actually just a bunch of Boolean algebras pasted together in an extremely tight um, <laughs> weave. And so to this extent, uh, we can think of quantum logic as somehow richer, more general than classical logic. All right, that's the standard story. It's best I'm able to tell it in 45 minutes. Let me take, I have about five minutes on the official clock. So I'll take five minutes and try to sketch another way of looking at quantum logic 
that has a very different flavor. We've already seen that quantum states correspond to uh, unit vectors, unit length vectors, or if you prefer points on a sphere. Here's a slice through a sphere. The red line is a state. And that, that sphere should be understood as a unit sphere. Let's define a measurement, or an experiment if you prefer, or a test, I sometimes call them, to be a pair in the case of this picture, but more generally a set of mutually orthogonal, mutually perpendicular unit vectors that's maximal. In other words, that you have enough of them to span the whole space. You can't fit any more in there. Think of that as, in some sense, a, a, a complete set of mutually exclusive alternatives or a, rep a representation you're going to use for such a thing. So in this picture, I have one unit vector, the red one representing a state, two others that taken together represent an experiment. Notice in this picture, unit vectors are playing a dual role. Sometimes they represent states, sometimes they represent measurement outcomes. There's a way of using the state vector to assign probabilities to the outcomes, if I can call them that, of this measurement, represented by the pair of orthonormal vectors. Um, and it's simply this. The probability of outcome x there in the state represented by v is the square of the component of v in the direction of x. You drop a perpendicular, you find that the length of the component is r, you square that. And if you're using complex numbers, you have to take the modulus squared. The Pythagorean theorem tells me, since this red line has unit length, that r, the component of v in the x direction, r squared, plus the square of the component of v in the, the y direction, s squared, must add up to 1, right? The square of the length of v. So that gives me a probability assignment on that pair of outcomes. It's actually better than that. If I rotate the, the orthonormal basis, the blue vectors, see I've kept the vector the same, but I've rotated the basis. Um, sorry, I can go through the same construction, take components, their squares add up to 1. So I get a simultaneous probability assignment to all possible orientations of that measurement from that one unit vector. This same construction works in higher dimensions. Here a test would be that pairwise orthogonal triple of vectors in, in three dimensions. So we have a picture in which we have a model of a system in terms of its states, but also in terms of a specific recipe for representing possible probabilistic or statistical measurements. And we have a rule for converting states into probability assignments. If we borrow language from probability theory, we might define an event, a quantum event, if you like, to be any subset of a measurement, which would simply mean some set of mutually orthogonal unit vectors, not necessarily a whole basis worth. So for example, in this previous picture, z and x would be one event. x and y would be another event, right? just as in classical probability theory and events a subset of the outcome set. Every vector state assigns a probability to every event. Just add up the probabilities of the outcomes therein. If you look at quantum mechanics in this way, you might be motivated to define a testable property to be a set of states that can be ruled out by a single observation, by making a single test and looking at the results. That would have to be the set of all states that assign probability zero to that event and if you think about the way states are assigning probabilities, that's exactly the set of unit vectors representing states that are orthogonal to all of the vectors in the set A. And that's a subspace. And indeed, every subspace has that form. So the testable properties become the subspace lattice we looked at before. You can attach probabilities to the testable, propos the, the testable proper properties in a pretty straightforward way, indicated at the bottom. Let me just make it quick and say we can do it. The quantum states assign probabilities not just to events, but to testable properties. And so from this point of view, you, you accept at the beginning a somewhat instrumentalist view of quantum mechanics as a kind of device for calculating probabilities. It's a probability calculus. Quantum propositions, from this point of view, simply are a restricted form of classical proposition. Either they represent events associated with a very special kind of measurement, or if you like, they represent the properties the system can have that can be tested in one go by making that kind of measurement and observing that a certain event um, has happened. The only thing that changes from the, from the point of view of logic broadly construed, the only thing that changes here is our view of probability. It changes slightly. Instead of having one big outcome set, one big sample space, we have all these little 
sample spaces corresponding to many different experiments. We have to pick one. They're in some sense incompatible. That's a fairly small change to classical probability theory. We do have to accept, however, that on that change, we're only going to assign probabilities. We only even attempt to assign probabilities to testable propositions, not to arbitrary propositions. At this point, it seems like we have a choice in how we want to view not just quantum logic, but quantum mechanics. We can take quantum logical properties, as I just indicated, just to be testable properties in terms of some prior concept of measurement, the one I sketched, in which case quantum logic is actually just a specialization of classical logic, certainly not a replacement for it. Um, it's actually, in many respects, like a modal logic, not too different, in fact. There's a way of interpreting it that way. The only thing we need to do is to broaden our understanding of probability theory a little bit. Alternatively, we can say quantum logical properties are, in fact, all the properties there really are in the world. You can take a hard line and say the world is quantum mechanical. The world itself is one big quantum system. Quantum mechanics doesn't say anything about properties of the state space of the world other than those corresponding to subspaces. The logic of the world is quantum logical. Um, if it seems classical to you, it's just because you happen just to be looking at a bunch of commuting observables all the time, or most of the time, except when you finally get around to discovering quantum mechanics. If that's the case, I think there, there may be something to say about a need to revise our ideas about how logic works, at least if we want to take a, a, a very naturalist line about logic and maybe about our mathematical models of physics. OK, so that's more than enough. Let me stop. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? If I say, let me stop, I'm actually asking you to let me do something that I've already done. <laughs> okay. It's like the kind, of, the, kind of, um, the kind of debt that you can pay by acknowledging that you have it. I owe you an apology. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, but you had, you had a question. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, you, you, you are the only hand I see raised at this point. Well, Oh, yes, I, yes. I wanted to uh, ask for an explanation of such a notion as accepting the truth tables. Okay. And also, when you're speaking of implication, you weren't speaking of material implication, were you? I was not speaking of the. Um, I was not speaking of the connective, if then. No, no, but uh, I, mean but, but I was speaking. I, the relation was material implication. Yes. But the re but if you say P is in that relation to Q. If Q is true whenever P is, uh, that's not adequate. For the reasons you've already discussed. It doesn't give you the full table. And oh, well, well, I should have said, how does one do this? If, if well, is I, IFF, yeah. whenever and only whenever um, All right. is what I meant. Yeah, I didn't, so well, sloppy I language. Quibble, but, but anyway, when you speak of accepting the truth tables, mm -hmm. that sets my teeth on it. I know. It seems to me the truth tables <laughs> exist. Yes. And there's nothing there to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you speak about how, class, how logic works, mm -hmm. for example, as if there was such a thing, or we talk about <laughs> classical logic, yes. there's truth functional propositional logic. Yes, which is what I'm talking about. Right. And, and anyway, surely it's not an empirical matter. It's an empirical matter whether that's useful for certain computational purposes. Yes. It seems to me just like talking about uh, somebody finding that if you go to the surface of a sphere and you mm -hmm. treat the geodesic as straight lines, uh, you find the Euclidean plane geometry right, doesn't right, work very right. well. Yes. But that's, that's an empirical discovery. Right. But there's still the geometric systems that's right. that are the same that's as right. they ever were. I, I, and I completely agree. Um, as, as, as I tried to say at some point, I, I'm skeptical about all of these claims. What Putnam wanted to do, I'm actually glad you brought up that example because it, it's, it's just exactly the sort of thing that he's discussing. What Putnam wants to do is to say, Straight lines in real physical space really are geodesics. They don't correspond precisely to the straight lines of the axioms of Euclidean geometry. So that's not to say the axioms of Euclidean geometry don't define something. But whatever it is they define, it's not the space we actually live in. Um, 
He goes on to say, and, and to discuss at length, the idea that at least originally geometry was, in his view, you know, the, the study of, and I guess he would also have probably wanted to say it ought to be, he would probably say things like, it really always has been, the study of the way real lines really behave in the real space we live in. For Putnam, it's very important that geometry has that character. It's very important for him to, to want to maintain that logic does or ought to have the same character, that it's really the study of how actual properties, actual real, I'm not sure he uses this adjective, but I will, physical properties, really do, as a matter of fact, hang together in the world we actually live in. He's got phrases in that article, I said it was wonderful rhetoric, I think they're beautiful, where he says, you know, someone might ask what it, I'm paraphrasing here, someone might ask what it's like to live in a world with a non-Euclidean geometry, or, or, or what it might mean to, 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 to be in such a world, and his reply would be, you live in one. And then he goes on to say, you might ask, what would it be like to live in a world with a non-classical logic? And his answer is, in fact, you live in one. It's just like what you experience, because there you are. I don't know how adequately that answers your question, but. It's just like it was hard for people to find out about the surface of the Earth, because yes. a lot of people thought it was roughly flat. Right, so exactly. So that, that's kind of his take. And he's not denying that classical propositional logic is perfectly self-consistent, and it defines what it defines. He's only denying that that maps properly onto the way real physical properties really behave. And the Platonists always used to deny that geometry is about any lines we could possibly Right, see. right, exactly. Yeah. But it's funny because there's kind of a conflict there. I mean, it's, it's a funny thing. You might expect there not to be, but I, I'm, maybe we'll talk afterwards, but there's maybe a certain tension between Platonism and naturalism about oh, these well. things. Uh -huh. Yes? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> More <laughs> okay. than attention. More than attention. Okay. All right. So, all right. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, well, um, yes and no. Um, it is true that quantum computing is actually a direct instantiation of the observation von Neumann made in his very early paper that you can treat projection operators, zero, one valued observables, as though they are coding for propositions, um, physically realizable propositions. Uh, nowadays, we can at least design, even though we can't quite yet build, um, computers in which logic gates are constructed out of quantum mechanical components, um, exactly instantiating von Neumann's quantum logic, or at least fragments of it. The fact that it's non-distributive is tied up with, I mean, as I guess should be clear, tied up with the fact that things superpose and therefore tied up with the very resources that allow you to, to beat classical computational power in, in, some, in some particular context, some particular algorithms. So the short answer is yes. Um, first and second, I think. Go ahead. So, so why did QM upset Putnam so much, right? I mean, there are all kinds of lattices that aren't distributed. You don't look at them and say, well, so classical logic. Right, right. Um, I think, I think, I'm not sure that it upset him. Actually, I think he was delighted. I think he was very happy. Um, I, I think he liked it because it was physics. Or at least it, was, it seemed to him he could make a strong case that our best physical theory was telling us that's the way the world is. If I simply write down an arbitrary non-distributive lattice and I say, look, there's some tinker toy model I can make of this, you're going to say, oh, sure, but, but you know, that and is not really and and that or is not really or and you know, it's not really logic. But he's now going to make this rhetorical move we were just discussing to say, ah, but if the world as a whole really hangs together this way, you know, I'm not going to allow you to say, say that. In fact, in his paper somewhere, he says things like um, you know, the, the quantum logical join that's what or all, always meant. It, it wasn't what we thought it meant, but it really is what it meant. So, you know. <laughs> I once gave a talk similar to this um, at a very different conference, and, and one of the, the people who was going to attend it was a, 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 a postdoc I know who, who said that he wanted me to take a hard line. He said, I hope this talk is going to be really bullshy, which was his adjective for a really hard line. And so I presented Putnam's attitude, and I said, is that you know, bullshy enough for you? And somebody observed that uh, at that time, Putnam himself was, in fact, 
quite bullshy. So anyway, good good rhetoric in that paper. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You had a question. I would like to clarify the concept of complement that you use in your slide. Yes. It seems to me in that case that it's a symmetric concept. The complement. When you look at the regular uh, set, theory, it is not. I can to be for you to be my complement. I have to be a subset of you. <coughs> You will not, I will not be your complement. That's not the sense in which I mean it. When I say complement, when I, when I talk about the complement of a set, first of all, I'm always talking relative to some ambient universal set. So when I talk about the complement of a set A, I mean the ambient set take away A. And the complement of the ambient set take away A is A itself. So the sense in which I meant to use the word is symmetric. Okay. And, and so is the, the, the ortho lattice definition. Calculate a complement of A with respect to B. A have to be a subset of B. A is a, I'm sorry, A is a subset of B prime. Okay. That's right. 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 Okay. Thank our speaker. Thank you.